<clears throat> Good morning, and now we are recording for Thursday, April 23rd, and our lecture today will cover Middle Age scholasticism and the Reformation period. So let's get started. Now, with Middle Age scholasticism from 1000 to 1600 AD, we have a new kind of learning. This is sort of a, a revival of learning that comes after what could possibly be a, a misnomer, but is often called the Dark Ages. And that's when we had a decline in attention to culture and literature and philosophy, because in the Dark Ages from around the fall of Rome in 410 up to 1000, it seems that people were just, uh, and, and cultures were more about just surviving, especially against the Scandinavian attacks, the political instability, and the attacks from Muslims. Right around 1000, things started to settle down a bit, and we now see a return to the works of Augustine, especially, uh, but sometimes quite critically of Augustine. Uh, but Augustine created a framework that they can go back to, and also the classic philosophers like Plato and Aristotle. Now, important figures during this period are Anselm and Peter Lombard, Peter uh, Abelard, and Thomas Aquinas, of course. Uh, Anselm and Aquinas are the two most prominent of all of them. So now the method in the Middle Age scholastic period combines two things. First of all, a religious empiricism. Empiricism is an approach to study where we use our observational abilities to really, uh, to really study things yeah, systematically, but in depth. And so during this period, we see that, uh, that the philosophers or the theologians, especially, they are going to oppose any sort of mysticism or Platonic dualism or the idea that the world is evil and now begin to study nature and scripture and theology again with a sort of intense methodology of, of observation using one's mind to observe and use reason and logic to observe the details of theology and scripture and nature. So uh, now, secondly, you also have a dialectical approach used in this period, which starts with Peter Lombard, but is really advanced uh, by Peter, uh, I'm sorry, by um, Thomas Aquinas. And I had you, I sent you Thomas Aquinas's a portion of his Summa Theologica, uh, let's see, book one, articles one, two, and five. I hope you get a chance to look that over. Let's just look at the dialectical method used here in Article 1. And dialectical, really, the root of that means two words. It's essentially a discourse between two or more opposing parties to try to seek truth. And often these are just fictitious parties. For example, by Aquinas' Article 1, you see where he sets up two objections against the first article, which is whether, besides philosophy, any further doctrine is required. And so the first objection you might be hear, you might hear from someone is that uh, it seems that besides philosophical science, we have no need for any further knowledge. For man should not seek to know what is above reason. Uh, and then he actually quotes an inter intertestamental literature, a Syriac, uh, seek out the things that are too high for thee. Or, I'm sorry, seek not the things that are too high for thee. But whatever is not, and, and Aquinas goes on, but whatever is not above reason is fully treated in the philosophical science. Therefore, any other knowledge besides philosophical science is superfluous. So that's the first objection you might hear to the article. The second one is laid out there, uh, something about going beyond knowledge, which is not important. So, and uh, then he provides his rebuttal. He says, on the contrary. So in each case, he re rebuts that with, oftentimes with a scripture or by quoting Augustine or some one of the church fathers. In this case, he quotes 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture inspired by God is profitable to teach, to reprove, to correct, and to train in righteousness or justice. Now, scripture, uh, 
Aquinas goes on. Now, Scripture, inspired by God, is no part of philosophical science, which has been built up by human reason. Therefore, it is useful that, that besides philosophical science, there should be other knowledge, i.e. inspired of God. So you see, Aquinas makes a distinction between revelation and philosophy. Of course, he will keep these very closely aligned together, and sometimes almost appear to overlap, but uh, he definitely distingu distinguishes them here. And then he will go on after the rebuttal to explain this, re uh, this, this, this rebuttal even further. And he says here, I answer that it is necessary for man's salvation, that there should be a knowledge revealed by God besides philosophical sciences built up by human reason. He goes on to explain that further using logic and scripture. And then he will end by replying to each of the two objections after his explanation. So that's the method he uses in each of the articles in the Summa, Summa Theologica, which is his summary of theology. It's quite an extensive summary because he, he covers every possible article of theology in depth. The, the nature of God, uh, the attributes of God, and the Trinity, that's just the start. Then he goes into the nature of Christ and the Holy Spirit and his understanding of salvation and even an in-depth section on angels, etc. So, okay. Now let's look a little, a little further into Anselm and how he really kicked off the scholastic period. And he does so by rediscovering the works of Aristotle through the Jewish philosopher Maimonides. Uh, and Aristotle, as you remember, he was a, a pre, uh, uh, he, he predated uh, Christ about 300 years. And he took Plato's philosophy, which was centered on the universal things, and started to say that, uh, that reality is, is based on the particular things in this world. And so Aristotle categorized uh, philosophy and science and, uh, and our, our human understanding based upon a systematic approach to knowledge. And that's the sort of format that Maimonides took up and that Anselm takes up. So he's gonna categorize uh, theology accordingly, according to the same sort of model. He begins, he actually begins his philosophy or his theology by looking at the famous quote from Augustine, faith seeking understanding. So if you remember, I touched on this regarding Augustine, is that Augustine said that we begin with the experience of faith, and then we seek to understand what we have experienced. And uh, so we started out with the priority of faith. And Anselm will begin with that as well. But then he wants to add, I believe that I may understand. So he wants to explain this further. I believe that I may understand. So now we see with Anselm that uh, theology has a new goal, that being understanding what I believe in depth, having not just an understanding of what I believe uh, that can uh, help me understand my faith, but now grounding all articles of faith in theology and in philosophy. So he wants to provide a reasonableness of faith so it can be defended and explained in depth. And uh, you see this in his Prosplogion, his ontological argument for God's existence, which he attempts to draw, draw out a, an argument that God exists based upon deductive reasoning. And so this is, Prosplogion means first word. So it's an argument from reason alone, not from the observation of this world. And the argument goes something like this, as was stated in Betzinson, uh, even the first, the first point, even the fool who says in his heart there is no God, like we see in the Psalms, must admit that there can be something in the mind of which nothing greater can be conceived. So even the fool can admit in their mind that there could exist in the mind nothing greater of which they could conceive or think of. Okay, then Anselm goes on and says, the next point, however, this something that exists in their mind is not the greatest if it exists only in the mind. And it would be greater if it also existed in reality. So therefore, his conclusion is that a being of which or than which no greater being can be conceived, i.e. God, 
must exist. And that may sound like some sort of trickery, but we've had other philosophers try to defeat that, and I don't think they've been successful. So I do think it, even though it is a little bit uh, uh, difficult, it does hold up. Well, okay, let's go on now and look at the, uh, one of the major debates in the scholastic period, especially as uh, provided by Anselm, is, has to do with the atonement of Christ. So now the interest returns to understanding what was the meaning of Christ's death on the cross. Now in the early church, just to understand the, uh, the, under, the, the basic uh, theology up to this point, is they held to what's called the ransom theory, or a classical theory. So it's held by Irenaeus, the many church fathers, uh, Augustine, likely held to this, Origen, and others. So the idea here, and I, I gave you a chart here, I emailed a chart to you, might want to make sure you printed that out, uh, that you can fill in now regarding the atonement. And this first view being the uh, ransom theory. Let me walk through, first of all, what's the problem for the sinner? <clears throat> and then what's the meaning of Christ's death on the cross? And the, what's the value of Christ's death for sinners? So in the ransom theory, the traditional theory, uh, the sinners are in bondage to Satan. And the church fathers reason that because of their sin, people belong to Satan. Uh, you can look at Paul in Romans 6, who talks about being slaves to sin. And then the meaning of Christ's death is that God offered his son to Satan as a ransom in exchange for sinners. Uh, but Christ could not be held in hell, could not be held in the grave. And he rises again on the third day in victory thereby leaving Satan without his prisoners and without his ransom. So it almost appears here as God tricked the devil, which is perhaps the weakness of this, fear, this theory, and which is also something that Anselm will point out. But the value to the sinner, according to this view, is that they're freed from enslavement to Satan. So Satan's power, no long, he no longer has power over the believer. It's been broken. And, you know, you can see the scripture, Mark 10, 45, uh, where Christ says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So, okay. Now, Anselm comes along and will try to refute that argument with what's called the satisfaction theory. And in this theory, the problem is that sin is oriented toward God the Father, not toward the devil. Sin dishonors the majesty of a sovereign God. And Anselm will write this all out in his little book, Cur Deus Homo, which means, why did God become a man? And he basically states here regarding the problem that God did not deceive the devil in the process of redemption as if the devil had some sort of rights. Rather, sin is a dishonoring of God's majesty, of his honor. And so uh, God could forgive the sinner, but that would not satisfy his uh, besmirched honor. Uh, so it's uh, as if God is like a king or a, a royal a ruler, and it's not proper for him to allow any irregularity uh, in his kingdom. So uh, it's almost like the notion of a besmirched king or a feudal landlord whose dignity has been thwarted. And so it's an insult to God. And that's so great that only God can provide satisfaction and restore God's honor. And yet that person that restores it must also be a man so that man can receive credit and stand on behalf of other men. Uh, but the meaning of Christ's death on the cross is that Christ actually satisfies God's honor. And as a result, Christ will be rewarded with merit or with righteousness. And so... Uh, Jesus, as both God and human, is able to provide this satisfaction. Satisfaction means meaning the, meaning the demands of divine honor and uh, a divine merit uh, is then uh, offered to the offended righteousness of God uh, rather than paying a moral debt of some sort. So Christ satisfies the demands of God's honor by his infinite merit. And uh, John 10, 18 seems to refer to this. 
where it talks about how Christ laid down his life willingly. He obeyed God uh, with his life. And as, in doing so, he gained an infinite amount of merit uh, that he doesn't have to use for himself. He can pass that merit, pass that righteousness on to the sinner. And that's the value to the sinner is the merits of Christ are applied to the sinner. And by his death, Christ gains merit with God and that's offered over to man so they can now essentially pay God with Christ. And uh, Aquinas will take this a bit further. He says that we can, we need to actually merit the merits of Christ. So, okay. Now, also in the medieval period, we will have somebody provide another theory of atonement somewhat as a, uh, a confronting of Anselm, and that is by Peter Abelard, and that's the moral influence theory, which is a more quote-unquote liberal theory. And uh, Abelard's quite an interesting guy. He was a priest, but he actually had a, um, a, a mistress, and he got her pregnant, so he put her up in a convent to try to uh, hide her away. But uh, okay, so the problem of the sinner, according to Abelard, is that the sinner's heart is cold toward God, and therefore we are suffering. Um, and so, uh, uh, yeah, that, that's the basic problem, is we're, because of our sin, we're cold toward God. We're, we're estranged relationally. We feel existential distance from God. So what does Christ do on the cross for us? It demonstrates God's love, God's care. And so this is in some ways attractive, but uh, it focuses on the value of God's love for us so it's a more of a subjective theory because of the uh, the sense of relationship that he seems to further or or try to restore. And uh, so through Christ, God voluntarily, voluntarily assumed the burden of suffering brought on by human sin. And so as a result, the value to the sinner is that they, they will be moved to repentance as they see God's love. And uh, the scripture there, that sometimes is used is Romans 5 8. God demonstrates his love towards sinners, and that while we're, they were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, lastly, I want to look at another theory of the atonement, which is a uh, major, one of the major four theories, and that's the penal substitution theory, which will actually come after the medieval period. Well, actually, I guess this is provided during the later part of the medieval scholastic period. And that is the uh, a theory put forth by the reformers. And now here in the penal substitution theory, the, uh, uh, the problem of the sinner is that they are guilty before God. They have a legal debt toward God that they cannot pay themselves. So God's holy character demands moral perfection. He cannot fellowship with anything that is unholy. And so actually the reformers will agree with Anselm but say he just didn't go far enough. So righteousness is not just viewed in terms of restoring God's honor, but also in terms of God's righteous law that has been broken. And so divine justice requires a penalty to be paid for sin. And you see this in scripture, like in Romans uh, 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Uh, so, uh, so that's the problem for humanity is they face this penalty, this punishment, and uh, that they have to pay for themselves. And uh, so what does, uh, what's the meaning of Christ's death? He provides a substitutionary sacrifice that takes on, essentially takes on the sin of the sinner and pays for that penalty himself. So it seems to reflect the Old Testament sacrificial system, as we saw when we looked at uh, the Old Testament briefly. Leviticus 16 talks about two goats that uh, Christ plays the plays the role of both of these. He takes on the role of both goats by sending away one's sins, but also by sacrificing himself on the altar for those sins. Uh, and so um, this is the idea of propitiation that we touched on in Romans chapter 3, a sacrifice of atonement. So, uh, and therefore, uh, Christ can satisfy the Father's righteous demands and uh, uh, for the law to be kept and uh, by taking on the, also the penalty for, for sin. Now, uh, as a result, the value to the sinner is that the demands of God's holiness and justice are met, so guilt is removed and they, uh, the sinner is forgiven. 
They're freed from all legal demands, as John Calvin stated in his Institutes, that Christ was estranged from God by sin, the heir of wrath, and liable to the cures of eternal death. Here Christ intervened as an intercessor. He received and underwent the penalty in himself, which was ready for all sinners by God's just verdict. He expiated in his blood the misdeeds, the rendered sinner, uh, misdeeds that the rendered sin rendered sinner made him hateful to God and by his atonement God the Father was satisfied and suitably pleased. A scripture uh, the entire chapter of Romans could be used here uh, as I said the wages of sin is death but the free gift of God is eternal life. That's Romans 6 23. Okay so those that's the atonement debate that uh, was centered central in the medieval period. Now lastly Let's look at Thomas Aquinas himself here. And this is considered, considered the high scholastic period. And uh, Aquinas is the most famous of the scholastics, later called a, a doctor of the church, and uh, a proponent of natural theology, and strong on the teleological argument, the design argument for God's existence, because he holds that believing that God exists comes before or precedes believing in God, having faith in God. So he sort of reverses the previous trend like with Augustine. And um, so now he has this, he, so he moves the, but he actually moves the church away from Augustine, away from Plato and toward, even further toward Aristotelianism, toward grounding one's faith in reason, in systematic theology in this dialectical method. And uh, his, he develops a philosophy of mind based upon what he calls a, a tabula rasa, a blank slate. He holds that we are given the ability to think and recognize the forms or ideas that are of God as if, uh, as if we had a, div a divine spark within us still. Uh, the image of God is still is still uh, uh, capable of being, uh, is still uh, intact, especially in our minds. So the will is fallen, Aquinas uh, 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 holds, but the mind is not. So he sees essentially a conflation, almost a complete conflation at times between faith and reason. So we've drawn this before, and I know there's a lot of theologians here that start with the letter A, so it's a little difficult to keep them straight at times, but this is Aquinas, Oops. and for him, faith and reason overlap more than anyone else up until this point, okay? They're distinct, and yet they overlap in many ways, and so um, it seems like he combines them, uh, yet distinguishing them, and um, these are two ways of, uh, of, 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 uh, using knowledge, two different forms or sources for our knowledge that can be used together to come up, come to the true knowledge of God. And um, so it seems like in many ways he blends Greek philosophy, especially Aristotle, with Christian doctrine. And again, he holds that belief that God exists should come before believing in God. So he starts with rational belief before uh, coming to faith. It seems like that's an opposite of Augustine. And also, his understanding of the nature of God is that he, well, he believes that the existence of God is neither self-evident nor beyond proof. And so it can't, we can prove the nature of God through well-thought arguments, especially various design arguments. So he lays these all out in Summa, Summa Theologica, and these would include the five ways, his famous five arguments for God's existence. And let me read these to you. Uh, I'd like you to at least write down what the five ways are, what the titles of these are. The first way is known as the prime mover. And here Aquinas says, it is clear that there are, there are in this world things which are moved. Now every object which is moved receives that movement from another. If the motor itself is moved, there must be another mover, another motor moving it and after that yet another, and so on. But it, it is impossible to go on indefinitely 
for then there would be no first motor and consequently no movement. So that's his first way, the, uh, the argument from the prime mover. The second way has to do with what he calls the uncaused cause, the uncaused cause. And there he says, we discern in all sensible things a certain uh, chain of efficient causes. We find, however, nothing uh, which is its own efficient cause, for that cause would then be anterior to itself. That cause would come before itself. On the, other, on the other side, it is impossible to ascend from cause to cause indefinitely in the series of efficient causes. There must therefore exist one self-sufficient efficient cause, and that is God. Okay, so these are, again, these are Aquinas' five ways. And the first one is the argument from the idea of God as prime mover. And this one, the uncaused cause. Maybe I should change pens. It's a little harder to see. And okay. Okay. And the third way is the argument from the idea of God as the necessary being. Okay, and reading that one, we find in nature things which may be and may not be, since there are some who are born and others who die. But consequently, uh, they consequently can exist or not exist. But it is impossible that such things should live forever, for there is nothing which may be as well as not be at the same time. Thus all beings need not have existed. Uh, thus if all beings may, must not have existed, there must have been a time when nothing existed. But if that is the case, nothing would now exist, for that which does not exist cannot receive life from one who exists. Uh, but from one who exists. Let me read that again. Uh, but in this case, nothing would not exist. For that which does not exist cannot receive life but from one who exists. There must therefore be in nature a necessarily existent being. Okay, and the fourth way is the argument from goodness. And here Aquinas says, any category has its degrees, such as good or better, warm or warmer. Each also has one thing that is the ultimate of that measure, like good and best, warm and hottest. And whatever is the most of that category is the source of that category, as fire uh, is the source of heat. And God must therefore, must therefore be the source of goodness. And lastly, we have the argument from natural order. And this is somewhat like the argument, the contemporary argument from intelligent design, but more perhaps the idea of an intelligent order. And uh, he says, everything sentient or otherwise progresses in an orderly way. Planets move in their orbits, light breaks from and combines into its spectrum, etc. Reality has a natural order which could not have come from nothing, yet precedes mere humans. So, okay. So that is our the five ways from Aquinas. And that finishes my overview of the Middle Age scholastic period. All right. Now let's begin on the Reformation. And here. Well, I need to take a break because I need to grab my Shelley book. So let me take a pause here. Thank you.